welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Naomi Hirahara returned to the mystery genre to tell the story of Mars, a grumpy old LA gardener and reluctant sleuth who was also a Hiroshima survivor. It's a story that is central to her life because it is her father's story. Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler and today Naomi explains why mystery was perfect for keeping the post-bomb story personal, not polarising. But before we hear from Naomi, just a reminder that the show notes for this binge reading episode are available at the website thejoysofbingereading.com. That's where you'll find links to Naomi's website and books, as well as a free ebook and information on how to subscribe to our podcast if you like what you hear. But now, here's Naomi. Hello there, Naomi, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Jenny. And my um, dog, Tulo's here, so just ignore him if he gets excited. (laughs) Oh, sure. Yes, I've seen pictures of him online, actually. Yeah, (laughs) He's very much part of the family, isn't he? Oh, definitely. Okay, so Naomi, before you wrote your award-winning mystery series about the Japanese gardener, You were journalist for 15 years, and you did write a number of more academic books on subjects of social or business history. Was there a once upon a time process when you were led to feel that fiction would be a better way to tell your story? Well, you know, initial, always in my mind, I wanted to write fiction. And the way I say it is, you know, I tell lies to tell the truth. So in spite of my training as a journalist, um, it was always my intention to write fiction. And I would do it, you know, after a full day at the newspaper or actually in the morning early, you know, um, working on like an uh, old fashioned Toshiba laptop and with those dot matrix printers. And then I would go into work and then afterwards I would um, go to a workshop at UCLA to try to hone my craft. But I think, I just feel like there's so much more freedom to write about what people are really going through um, in, in fiction, you know? And um, so, but, you know, those two worlds, like journalism, I mean, some people think, Journalism is make-believe, but no, if you're, you know, a a very committed uh, practitioner of that, you want to get as many facts in, you want to be objective. And sometimes it's hard to break through that to write from a very um, strong point of view, um, a very subjective kind of um, voice. Um, I think that's like many journalists have problems with kind of capturing that in writing a novel, you know, writing a mystery, writing fiction. So that's a process. Sure. And certainly you've been praised for the wonderful um, intimacy of, of Mass Arise voice, that, that you really feel as if you do know what this ageing, rather curmudgeonly widowed Japanese gardener in LA, what his feelings and experiences are. So that's a real tribute to you. I gather that he may have been based on your own dad. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Um, Definitely. In terms of his chronology, it's very much like my father. My father was born in California, um, raised, you know, on a farm. And then because of circumstances in the family, they had to return um, to Hiroshima. And that became my father father's new home and um so he was still relatively young um during world war ii 
And um, so he was in Hiroshima when the bomb fell. So he was atomic bomb survivor. And then as soon as he could, as soon as he turned 18, he um, got on a boat and came back to his birthplace, California. And I just think, you know, when you talk about like the atomic bomb, it's so polarizing. You know, people take sides, you know, um, politically. But I think for myself, I wanted to write... Um, something very personal. And I just thought that atomic bomb survivor who is actually American would um, kind of tear through like all the kind of polarizing elements. This is like a, a, a individual story. So, um, so I, and then just so that I didn't have to worry about, could this have really happened to a person? Do you, you know, um, that's why I kind of stuck to my own father's history. However, his um, personality is totally different. Um, as you described, Moss is a curmudgeon. My dad had a, you know, he had kind of a, a little prickly side too in some ways. But in terms of our relationship, we're, we were very close. And I say that there's no way, you know, because I started this project when in my 20s that there's no way a young woman could try to get into a head of an older man unless she had a very close relationship with her own father. So that was the case with me. Sure. And in fact, I must say, I'm sorry to be so ignorant. I've even got a history degree. But until I read your books, I did not realize that there were quite a lot of American citizens that were caught in the Hir Hiroshima bombing. Yeah, um, Hiroshima, uh, the most migrants from Japan were from Hiroshima. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. You know, actually, to be an immigrant, usually you can't Unless you're a refugee, you're not the poorest of the poor. You need, you know, a little bit of cash to get out of the country. So so for various reasons, a lot of people came from Hiroshima. And um, so a, a lot of people in the um, uh, United States, as well as other countries, Latin America, they have some ties to that area of Japan. So um, and what happened was um, due to you know, discrimination in America, I think some of the parents were thinking, hmm, I don't know if this is going to be a good home for my for my children. Maybe we, I should, you know, have them educated in Japan or, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So that's why a lot of young people were actually sent to Japan um, to get educated or spend some time or le learn the culture. So, um, and yes, people did get caught during World War II. And, um, and sometimes, you know, they were uh, faced um, some kind of discrimination in Japan. So these people were truly kind of a people without a country in one sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and here, uh, sometimes people don't think of us as Americans when, you know, people of color, but, but in Japan, they weren't seen as Japanese. So, I think that's such an irony, but I think it also helps people to understand who these people are and their allegiances and their culture. You know, they're not just because we have a Japanese face doesn't mean we're necessarily, you know, all Japanese. So, yes, yes. You've said that it was your parents, quotes, dream and worst nightmare to be immortalized in a book. And I wonder if you could help explain a little bit more about those conflicting feelings. Well, you know, my first book, Summer of the Big Bachi, took me 15 years to write. So, you know, when you tell people I'm working on this novel, they're like, when is it going to be published? When is it going to be done? You know, so and then after a while, they almost get tired of asking you. But um, I think because in my family, I have, you know, my parents are not um, journalists or storytellers of any type, you know, even orally. So um, I think the notion of having a child, you know, be a writer is a bit scary. And especially since I was writing about people like my parents, they're not my parents, but there's some similarities. And, and so to be kind of, um, I think they felt like things became very transparent, you know, things were not as private as they uh, had hoped 
um, because of what I was writing about. If I was writing fantasy or science fiction or what, you know, a, a, a different type of story, you know, I don't think they would have felt so vulnerable. But so when I was at a mystery convention in Monterey, California, you know, I kind of I showed my father, you know, my my cards because you you always have to do promotion like meet Masarai, you know, Japanese American gardener, atomic bomb survivor, reluctant sleuth. And he's like, hey, this is me. <laughs> And they knew what I was writing about, but I think just to see it in print was, but I'm saying, dad, you're not a reluctant sleuth, you know, <laughs> but, and then my mom was, you know, she sunk, she got on the hotel bed and was saying, oh, what am I going to do? Because she was afraid that her friends would just view this as our life. You yeah. Know? And, um, I just told them, you know what, you guys have to just be tough and strong because we're kind of, you know, in terms of our family, and I think in some ways in literature, you know, there's just not many stories told from a point of view like Moss. That, um, mm, oh, totally. So we, you know, just for the sake of representation and, you know, just getting different kinds of stories out there, we had, you know, we have to just forge ahead. <laughs> And I imagine that when the book did finally come out, they were probably very happy. I don't think there would have been a lot there that they would have been upset about. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, you know what? My mother to this day, she's still alive. She does. She has not admitted that she's read any one of my books <laughs> in its entirety. I think she's uh, frightened, you know, and some of it, I don't blame her. Um, you know, it's funny because I meet, some of my colleagues, their um, parents are, are writers themselves and, you know, they immediately, you know, read the drafts of the book and they're their biggest cheerleaders. And my mother is a cheerleader, but it's more like, like if she'll come to my events and she'll make like this amazing spread of food and she'll like kind of watch like, oh, you sold a lot of books at that event, you know, so she'll yeah, count. Yeah. She's <laughs> so proud, but she doesn't counting. really understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is scary. It, you know, in, if I were in her situation, I would probably be scared myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and also your parents were both there the day the bomb was dropped and you said that one of them wanted it talked about and the other thought it should be forgotten. Did that affect you growing up? How did that sort of work in the household? Well, I think that um, my mother's the one. She she is considered an atomic bomb survivor, but she was not there when the bomb was dropped. She was in the countryside, but she was a ch she was eight years old. But since her mother, my grandmother, had picked, they didn't know what it what what had happened. So when she picked, she was in the countryside um, at a, like a Buddhist temple and they picked, because it was, dang, it was, you know, Hiroshima, close to Hiroshima as a naval base. So it was targeted for different types of, you know, bombings. So they, um, my grandmother picked her up and brought her into ground zero, you know, and I just, it just so horrific for me to think about. They were looking for my grandfather, my mother's father you know in the ruin yes yeah and just because my mother was um exposed to radiation um that's why she qualifies as a atomic bomb survivor but she you know just her personality she's the type you know to tell a stranger like this whole story and um i think my grandmother my mother's mother she was the one who really kind of um not gave me the baton, well, in a sense, gave me the baton because she was, you know, she survived the bomb herself. And she, when I was 14 years old, you know, she took me to the Peace Park and she, you know, told me um, the story of our families. And I, I really felt like I was a witness to a witness. I was too mm. young to have seen it, but I just felt like, you know, this is an important story um, in our family. And mm. I just felt like I should, you know, I need to maybe do something with this. Not necessarily responsibility, but, you know, because this is what I do. I tell stories. I go, this is a story that I, I should tell. But, you yes. know, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to be told. But um, 
And with my father, he was just not the type to just go into a lot. You know, he he was um, articulate when it came to more philosophical things, maybe not so s- specific historic things. But I think I was able to read between the lines to kind of mm-hmm. understand where he came from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a very evocative picture which you've got on your website of you as a three-year-old in Hiroshima, shoulder deep in a field of flowers. And I must say it really brought to mind almost immediately an impressionist landscape with poppies and women and children in the fields. And it's such an idyllic scene. And when you think that such a short time before there'd been such horror there, I, I just wondered, did you remember anything of that particular visit? It obviously is a treasured photo. You know, it, it's funny with memory because sometimes I'm wondering, am I really remembering things or is it because I've seen photographs of them? Mm. But I think I do remember like, so we were separated from my grandmother because she was in, you know, I was raised, I was born and raised here and she was in Japan. But I remember like being um, like hanging onto her back, being carried you know, on her back. Mm. And I think, Mm. and I think I remember umbrellas, but I think I do. um, My uh, relative had, who's a photographer had taken me to that spot. Um, And I think I was riding on back of a motorcycle. So I kind of remember that, but I had gone to Hiroshima last year to do research on the last Maserai. And my relative, my, it's like my father's aunt, Um, She took me to that exact same spot. You know, she remembered. She goes, this is, unfortunately, it was summertime, so there weren't that, you know, it was hot. So there weren't that many flowers. But she goes, this is the spot where they took a photo of you. And so it was very eerie to kind of revisit that, like, 50 years later. So I kind of took a photo, you know. (laughs) It's marvelous that it wasn't covered by a shopping mall. (laughs) True, yeah. That area is still pretty much country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the sixth Mass Arai book has just recently been published, I think, Sayonara Slam. And as you've mentioned, the last one and the seventh in the series, Hiroshima Boy, is due out early next year. I wonder, did you always have a series in mind when you started? You know, with the first book, actually, I... I thought it, I never thought it was going to be a series per se. I think I like, um, JD, I love, um, JD Salinger and, um, some of his kind of quote series books where he kind of goes back to the glass family and kind of, I think he wrote about the glass family and short stories. And, um, you know, so I was kind of developing a relationship with my characters. And I was thinking, with the, this is with the first book, it sure would be nice to visit them again. But um, so Random House picked up the first book, but they said, oh, well, this is contingent that you deliver a second book in a year. So it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'm writing a series. <laughs> then. <laughs> but yeah, after Sayonara Slam, the third one, that's when I said, you know what? I think if I'm going to continue this, I need a little roadmap. Like, I don't want to just have it fade out. You know, do I want to be more intentional? So um, at that time, I was thinking of definitely seven. And I did want to end it in Hiroshima. But I had no idea how I was going to do that because it's not, I hadn't been back to Japan to visit I studied there for a year after college. I hadn't been there back in such a long time, so I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't sure how it was going to get done, but that was my intention. Yeah, well, that's great, and and it is a nice circle of completion to have it finished there. I'm sure that that will be a satisfying read. And then after Mass, you you've now introduced us to Officer Ellie Rush in the Bamboo Mystery series. She's a young LAPD cop on a bicycle with an aunt in high places in the police force who's probably as much as a li- of a liability as she is an asset. So where did Ellie come from? Well, you know, one thing is when you write um, an amateur sleuth like like the Maserai series, you're always come, you know, 
against this whole notion of how can this regular person, why is this regular person encountering all these dead bodies? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, I have to write, like, uh, uh, well, there were a couple things. One was, um, unfortunately, my father was uh, Ill, Ill and he eventually passed away right before I wrote, like, the fifth Maserai. And in the back of my mind, I was going, I have to write something from a young person's perspective, you know, just to add levity to my own life. And um, so so there was that. I was teaching a class at UCLA, and I fell in love with the students. And I really just love, you know, a young person's sense of, op- there, there's such conflicting emotions with them. They're very optimistic and ambitious, but on on the other hand, there's a lot of insecurity. So um, I just loved that. And I wanted to write a character who was dealing with those type of things and just wondering about her life decisions. She wanted to be a a police officer like her aunt, but her, her, um, her peers don't understand why. And her parents, her mother especially, was not supportive. So, you know, I just, she was kind of born like, you know, and, and here, I don't know, you're you're over in New Zealand, right? Um, I don't know if you have many bicycle cops there. No, we don't have any bicycle cops. It's very um, popular. You know, it first started in the beach communities and now they're in urban areas and they're just finding that... It's a way of policing that you you actually develop relationships with your constituents. Um, It's less threatening. It's not like you're riding in a black and white squad car. You know, you get to know people. Um, You it's more just, you know, like if there's a drug transaction, sometimes it's those kind of things happen very quickly, you know, on the side of a street and a bicycle cop can kind of um, be there and view it more easily than someone in a car. So for a number of reasons, um, it's become quite popular. And I I worked in downtown Los Angeles for such a long time uh, um, at a newspaper and working on different projects. And I just thought, you know, in a way, it's kind of like a small village, even though it's downtown L.A., because we have, um, you know, produce market, we have flower market, we have all these weird industries, you know, garment district, toy district right next to each other. And so I thought um, it, in that compressed space, I could um, create kind of a, a fun um, series. Yeah, yeah. And it certainly gives you the feeling of being introduced to parts of LA that um, you weren't really aware of that existed as as somebody who just might be a tourist there. Perhaps moving away from specific books to talking a little bit more generally about your career, Naomi, is there one thing you've done with your writing more than any other that's been the secret to your success? Oh, you know, um, I was thinking that's a really good question. And it's kind of hard to see yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it's almost better to like ask another person. So what am, what am I doing? I don't know. But I, I do think it might be, um, an, an openness, um, but with an eye on the big picture. And by that, mm-hmm. I mean, I think when I was, um, you know, during those 15 years of writing the first book, um, you know, I went to a lot of classes and there was a, a salon, a literary salon and, one of the speakers said that he he's he, I think he was I don't know if it was an agent or editor, but he said something like he's looking for storytellers, not necessarily writers. He's looking for storytellers. And when he said that, I was just thinking, I mean, what does he mean by that? You know, I was I think in my early 20s and kind of and now I, I've come to understand that um you know, we can take tell stories in so many different ways. Like, you know, if you look at playwriting or, you know, films, you know. Mm, memoirs, yeah. Yeah, and different genres. And I just mm. took that to heart. And because when I st- uh, started writing the Moss book, it wasn't in the mystery genre. You yeah. know, just became yeah. that 
I learned that that was the right container. And um, so I've just um, come to not, and there's so much changes in the, and disruptions in terms of publishing. And I just mm-hmm. find you can't just uh, stick to one thing or else sometimes, you know, I, I'm still writing nonfiction and I'm doing like um, exhibit work now, um, curation and, and now, and that's storytelling with artifacts, mm-hmm. or so, you know, and, and sometimes doing something that you normally don't do that much, it kind of helps you with your writing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, so I think that's maybe something different about me um, compared to other, other writers. Sure. It's, uh, it's really interesting. I mean, I was thinking about it from your point of view and thinking that the whole story of mass could have been a memoir, but I think it's so much more interesting to do it the way you've done it as a mystery. It, it just somehow makes it more alive. And then I know, um, one of uh, the letters I got like the first year was from, I live on the West Coast. It was a woman from the in Massachusetts on the East Coast of um, the United States. And she mentioned like Moss is a curmudgeon, and da, 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 but she goes, but I really miss him, you know, after reading the first book. <laughs> and then I go, okay, this is the beauty of um, fiction because I think people do develop I mean, you can on certain memoirs uh, develop a uh, relationship, but I think really with fiction, you know, people like own that person, you know, that's why they don't like certain film adaptations because that's not what they envisioned in their head, you know, is that, so I go, this is the beauty, you know, people get attached, um, people get emotionally involved and um, yeah, so that's, and then with someone like Moss, who is, he, he, you know, you have to go inside his head, you know, and yeah. and that's what right, you know, that's the beauty of a novel versus even film, you know, you can do that. Mm, yes, that's right. Look, just slightly changing tack. If you were going to organize a magical mystery literary t- tour for either of your series, where would you suggest that readers go? Well. You know, I am, um, th- there's two, there's two kind of strands to possibilities. One is the whole Japanese style garden tour of, um, oh yeah. Oh, that would be fabulous. Of Los Angeles. And there's a lot of, um, Japanese American gardeners who were a part of that. Um, and what's kind of interesting is like, and, and I mentioned them some of these gardens very briefly. The one in the second book, Gasa Gasa Girl, um, it, it, it refers to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. So this magical tour, you're going to have to jump around a lot in the U.S. But the one on New York, um, it's in uh, Brooklyn, and it's one of the first uh, Japanese-style gardens in a public garden in the United States. And what's really funny is they they hired like Italians, you know, to to work on it. So there's like grotto like rock work over there. So I think part of the magical tour would be to jump around and um, see all these like Japanese style gardens where you see like it's a hybrid, you know, it's a combination of of not only the, the Japanese but like the materials and the things of people. Who, who lived in that area or worked in that area. Of course, with Ellie, you know, that one is within a five mile radius. So that may be more doable. Um, what's fun is like, there's kind of a Renaissance happening in some of the ethnic communities in downtown mm-hmm. LA, like Chinatown. Um, there's like some cutting edge uh, chefs that are opening up little pop-up restaurants and things um, there. So that would be, and then also I would have to take people, this would the, be the intersection of Ellie and Moss is in, in this concrete jungle of downtown, there's a beautiful um, Japanese style garden um, in little Tokyo and it's kind of hidden for view. It's like more on basement level. So you have to almost, it's like a secret garden. 
and it's really gorgeous. And there's three different levels re- representing the different generations of Japanese uh, immigrants and their children and their grandchildren. And and um, there's water and a bridge, and it's just you know, it just it you, it gives you a sense of peace in <laughs> in all this like you know, urban traffic. So it's really wonderful. That sounds absolutely gorgeous. And I really think I'll have to get you to give me some links so that we can put it into the show notes because I, for one, would love to be able to know where to go to see it. It sounds gorgeous. Hey, just moving on to um, you as a reader, Naomi, we, because this is called The Joys of Binge Reading. And one of the premises of it is that this, the development of this popularity of series is partly because people like to invest time in a character and then keep reading about them. Have you yourself ever been a binge reader? And if so, who has attracted your attention? Um, there's so many. I mean, um, obviously I've been influenced by Walter Mosley um, who and his Easy Rawlings um, series in which he writes about it. African American um, man in like the 1940s, and then he kind of goes, and it's a mystery series, and he kind of covers, uh, Af- you know, uh, social political things through his characters, and it's it's really, it's a really fun way to kind of learn things as well. Uh, I am, you know, I am a sucker for a lot of the Nordic mysteries. Um, the, as well as uh, um, like Tana French, you know, I love. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and what she does is so um, unique because she doesn't necessarily follow, you know, they're all in the same circle, but she follows different characters like um, in the in in the murder, you know, the the homicide department of the the, you know, the Irish um world that she's created yes. so those yeah. are some of them that I thought but I do I love series and I love episodic te- tv mystery series I'm like a total junkie for all the British yeah. <laughs> you know mysteries and there's just I love Grandchester I love you know there's so many series that I love actually I see that on one of the um Japanese websites you do series writing yourself I'm- picked up yeah oh those are serial yeah so it's kind of those are things that um are just really fun for me and I don't really plan it out that carefully um and I think and and that's kind of the fun thing too I think sometimes we're so um we get really precious about our writing but then I think for some people it in immobile it kind of paralyzes them um, yeah. Sometimes, and you yeah. need to have fun. Yeah. You need to have fun. Yeah, yeah. So our time together is coming to a close. I'm just wondering, sort of circling round from the beginning to the end, what is next for you as a writer? And I see that you've mentioned that you're working on a new historic series set in Chicago. That's definitely a departure for you. How did that come about? It was actually through um, doing this nonfiction book that will also be coming out next year. I co-wrote it. It's called Life After Mansonar. Um, Mansonar was one of the deten- uh, ten- detention camps here in the United States that um, mm-hmm. incarcerated Japanese Americans during World War II. And um, this book, nonfiction book, is like what happened to these people after they're released. And Chicago was one of the places the government wanted uh, Japanese Americans to resettle in. So there was only like 400 people, and then it just you know went up to 20,000. And there was a lot of actually criminal activity that happened um, at that time. And <laughs> me being a mystery writer, I'm looking at that. Go, this is. And, uh, and also there were gangster, you know, different um, just uh, legacy of that area. And I go, and it just got my head spinning. And um, I've always wanted to do a book with a Japanese American woman like it, that, uh, that grew up in the 40s. That was in her 20, maybe early adulthood in her, in the 1940s. But um, when I read that about Chicago, I go, okay, I think I can, I want to explore that. This young woman who 
you know, was from LA in camp and then released to Chicago and, um, and just kind of, I, I, I think this might be not as light, you know, it might be a little mm-hmm. more noir, mm-hmm. um, than I usually write. So although I've written dark short stories, so it's going to be interesting. I don't to tell you the truth, Jenny. I'm not sure if I can pull it off. Um, but that makes me excited. <laughs> Yeah, I'm absolutely sure you can pull it off, Naomi, I'm sure. So it'll be early 50s, will it? Late 40s? Late 40s. Early... It'll be during World War II. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it'll be like 43, 44, you know, and it might be a trilogy, I'm thinking. Uh-huh. So it will be actually set in the camp. Um, it will be after. After, so it'll be, yeah. yeah. They, they started um, releasing people into the interior of the U.S. and 1943. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it'll be around that time. I mean, the war is still going on, but it'll be around that time. Yeah. Great. So just coming to a conclusion, where can people find you online and and with your books? Where is the best place for them to connect with you? They could go on Facebook. I have an author page, Naomi Hirohara Books. So they could go there. And then my website, www. Naomi, N-A-O-M-I, Hirahara, H-I-R-A-H-A-R-A.com. And um, I'm going to be um, revamping my website a little more. But yeah, that's the best way to reach me. And my uh, email and other information's right there. So That's great. And I, I did pick up that you're going to be the guest of honor at a crime convention in Reno early next year. That'll be fun. It's going to be a blast. We're going to do karaoke we're going to do improv i want to mix because as guest of honor i guess i guess i have a say and i don't want just like talking heads on panels i want to actually like do things so it'll be a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> look thanks so much for taking your time out today to talk to us naomi it's been fantastic i really enjoyed it thank you jenny And I've been to Auckland, by the way. (laughs) Oh, good. Come again sometime. (laughs) Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Finch Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading. The Joys of Binge Reading podcast is put together with fantastic technical help from Dan Cotton and Abe Raffles. Dan is an experienced sound and video engineer who's ready and available to help you with your next project. Seek him out at dcaudioservices at gmail.com. That's D for Daniel, C for Charlie, audio services at gmail.com. Or check our show notes. He's fast, he takes pride in getting it right, and he's great to work with. Our voiceovers are done by Abe Raffles, another gem of sound and screen. Abe has 20 years of experience on both sides of the camera slash microphone. As a cameraman director and also as a voice artist and TV presenter. I think you'd agree that his voice is both light-hearted and warm. He is super easy to work with no matter what the job. You'll find him at Abe, A-B-E, at pointandshoot.co.nz. As I say, the full details in the show notes on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully see you next week. Bye.